the holy book says in john chapter 15 verse 16 you did not choose me but i chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit that your fruit should abide it also says in psalm 113 the lord will give him a seat with the leaders of the people lagos state has always been a bustling cosmopolitan city a melting pot we are nationals of different countries as well as nigerians from various parts of the country lived and interacted with great cordiality enjoying life in a well-planned and well-ordered environment in the mid 1930s another shoot of Jesse, a young customs officer, Michael Okoje, who hailed from the royal family of the rustic town of Urumi, Edo State, met, courted, and married Lucia Adumola, the first daughter of Papita Adeshokun Afolabi, the then headmaster of Holy Cross Call, Lagos. Though it seemed at first sight that this young couple had little in common. Coming from different backgrounds, Michael from Edo State and Lucia from Oyo State, they in fact are two very important things in common. The first of this is royalty. Michael comes from the royal family in Urome, while Lucia a descendant of the Jagu compound of Oyo Alafi, their second and vastly more important bonding factor is that they both come from staunch Catholic families. The joy of Prince and Princess Michael and Lucy Okoje, who had settled in Lafiaji on Lagos Island, knew no bands when the wife, Lucia, gave birth to their first child, on June 16, 1936, three days after the feast of St. Anthony of Padua, and to further increase their joy, that child was a boy, a very significant factor among African families, where it is considered an assurance of the perpetuation of the family name. The baby baptized Anthony and given the other names, Olubome Ehohime was by virtue of his ancestry a double prince. I do not know how my father and my mother managed to come together. Uh, my father is a prince from Benin, and my mother is again from another language of where she's a princess of her own from Oyo dynasty. Well, I am the product of the two. And so I've been able to tell you that uh, I wear two crowns. That's good. <laughs> and then well, the church added another one, making three. So I, I don't know, may the good Lord be praised. So certain things happen in one's life that you just cannot direct, except the good Lord that directs it. When I was younger than I am now, my father intended me to be a doctor or an engineer. And uh, he was grooming me towards that. But by on, the, on the way, about the way, I, I think God said, no, that is not the way for this gentleman. And so I gradually began to take to, to priesthood. I was an altar server in the Holy Cross Cathedral for some time. Then we moved to St. Michael's Lafayette. It was why we were in St. Michael's Lafayette that I really uh, drew the line that yes, I think God wanted me. I was in St. Gregory's College for three years, and uh, that's from 1951 to 1953. At the end of 53, I found myself in the minor seminary at Okere Ibado, in Ibado. Okere Seminary is a regional one. We have students coming from uh, far back from the north, some parts of uh, the then no west and then Lagos. But this time everything is scattered. So we only have Lagos, Ibadan, and a few from other places. Lagos has the largest number in the 
seminary. And that is one of the reasons why we saw no need for building a, a minor seminary in Lagos itself. Because to do that means that we are trying to kill the goose that is laying the golden egg. That's the seminary you care anybody. Being born of educated parents, little Tony started his primary education at St. Mary's Private School, Broad Street, Lagos. He later moved to Holy Cross Primary School, Lagos, at the age of eight, within the regulation ages of seven to nine years for children to start school. As a child, Anthony Okoje attended morning mass every day. First, at St. Matthias Catholic Church, Lafayette, not far from home. And later, at Holy Cross Cathedral on Catholic Mission Street, Lagos Island. As usual with Catholics, little Tony did not have breakfast before going to morning mass. And as he wouldn't have time to return home to eat before school, his parents would give him money before he left for mass. So, he would buy himself some food in school. Well, that was his parents' intention. But what happened for the money was something totally different. Anthony almost invariably gave the money to pupils who didn't bring food to school and had no money to buy any. So, he went hungry instead. My father was a custom officer, and you know what that means. He's one of those who goes into the ship to examine, I don't know what to do there, examine things and then back. And because of that, at times his job takes him far into the, now, into the day. So he comes very, he comes late. And my mother, of course, she's the only one looking after the, her own children. My father hasn't got too much influence on us because of his work. But my mother had a very big influence on us. Every Saturday, she, had, she made it a point of duty that before we go to bed, she must narrate one or two stories in the scriptures. Maybe that of Abraham today, maybe that of Isaac, maybe something else. And then we always draw in the memorial. And uh, each day, before she goes to another one, like a very good teacher, she will ask you, what did I say yesterday about Abraham? And then, what is the moral? I think that also contributed to the vocation that the good Lord gave me. Incidentally, one of us too, my sister, Sister Mary Peter, she too is a, she's a reverend sister today of the Eucharistic of Jesus. So the memory that I have, really, it's about my childhood, going to school, like any other person, at times we just fake marriage, you know, you leave some of your meals here and there. You say you are going to be the husband, you just choose between us as children, you know. And then you have somebody who will act the part of a priest, I used to be myself. And uh, whether you know how to speak English or not, you pretend as if you are speaking English. And somebody will be interpreting. And then you bring the two, the man and the, the boy and the woman together, I say, we are joining them. So things like that were happening, and if even fake, we fake mass, you know, and then we try to mimic the priest. I didn't know that all these things were leading me into the way the good Lord wanted me to go. So that is that. He was one of the most generous students I had ever met. He was generous. I will come to that. Um, Okoje, that's how I call him would spend his own money feeding other people who did not have money. And then um, it came to a stage that he would go hungry himself, giving, uh, feeding, I mean, using the money that his father gave him to feed other students. And I had to come to rescue for him to join me in shutting my own ration to feed to us to feed for the money that my father gave me. His father was a very neat man always wearing white and immaculate white at that time and he was known as the neatest man in Lagos. Generosity was not Anthony Okoje's only virtue. He was a paragon of neatness. 
always keeping his uniform spotless to the great approval of his teachers and the envy of his colleagues. It is believed that if there was a gene for neatness, he must have inherited it from his father, Prince Michael Okoje, who was jokingly dubbed the neatest man in Lagos due to the fact that he was always dressed in immaculate white clothes. We never carried the royalty into our heads. My father himself never did. I thank God my mother actually never did herself. So we always, we always know that we are like any other children. So there's no, no problem, nothing about it. And I think that went a long way. Because uh, whenever people say things about uh, royalty, my father would just look at them and then smile. I said, what kind of... You know, it's, a priest doesn't say it's a priest. That's my belief of my father. And uh, he... I like him for one thing. He, it's only when you put your fingers in, in his mouth that you know this man is tough. So he's like that. And when he's annoyed, I think I got that from him. When he's annoyed, he comes up, boom, like a petrol. And as soon as the, the petrol burns up, that's it. He doesn't keep, keep, keep malice at all. My mother, on the other hand, well, you know women, she talks and she nags and she's very often annoyed. And, uh, well, I think when I look at both of them, I'm not God, but I, I think my mother seemed to be more spiritually minded than my father. That's why I saw it. So we know that someday, sometime, something good will come from that family. And I think it did. So that's the product we are now seeing. Anthony was an avid footballer and in those days when the maxim was if you miss the ball don't miss the leg he stood out by not conforming to the rough play tactics of his colleagues he would never deliberately kick anyone's leg on the field of play it seems anthony had been practicing the virtue of fair play long before the world football body FIFA came up with a slogan. He was a great footballer. He was formed, there was one of our seniors who formed a team of these small, young, young shot little ones called Beat. That was the name of the team, Beat. And they played not only in Okare, but against clubs in Ibado. Yes. He will tell you himself, rascal in the positive sense. He was a rascal in the positive sense. Yes, he, he was one of those students who will dare so many things, go out when they are not supposed to go out. But I said in the positive sense. You know, some people will do things just to defile authority. No, he wasn't like that. And I think that's why God didn't allow him to, be, to have been caught. <laughs> but he did life. He did many things. Though a few social clubs, such as Onikon Boys Club, Lafia G Boys Club, and others existed then, Tony did not join any of them, preferring to lead a simple social life. There was also the cultural trado religious Egungu festival, characterized by gaily dressed Egungu masquerades, parading the streets with their many followers, drumming, singing, and dishing out a lot of weeping with canes, either in play or in fury. That was very exciting for children, and many of them participated in this. But not Tony. He preferred to be a spectator. The only time he became an enthusiastic participant was at Christmas time when young boys and girls would form a big groups, drumming, singing, and dancing along the street from house to house, collecting money from those who offered it. Then we started singing. I don't need kilo shenyi tem fosoke tem belugo kilo shenyi tem fosoke 
Tembelugo olubumi abe awada ko wa tu won ka abe abe o abe abe this was seeded and cleaner form little old tony also took part in drama productions where a preferred role was that of a catholic priest um, knowing the, the kind of life he was living it didn't come as a surprise that eventually became the reverend father so in a nutshell i just want to say that bros tony had a call almost from his mother's womb as to what he was going to be in life obviously god's call to the priesthood was already beginning to stay in his heart and tony did not let his extracurricular activities interfere with the studies and his high intelligence in hard work paid off when while still in standard five in 1951 he passed the entrance examination to the prestigious St. Gregory's College of Balende, Lagos. As with most parents in those days, Prince and Princess Michael Okoje, Tony's parents wanted him to be a doctor or an engineer, but God had bigger plans for their first child. And his divine plans soon started to unfold in 1953. And with absolute no prompting from Anthony, who was then in Form 3 at St. Gregory's College of Balinde, Reverend Father John Kilby, SMA, Tony's mentor, and Archbishop John Kwao Age, having discovered a growing spirituality in him, considered him a fit candidate for the priesthood. They seemed like the fulfillment in Anthony Okoje's life of the aforementioned Bible passage. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Well, passing is very certain, you know yourself. I remember 19, towards the end of the school year, 1953, when I told my classmate I was going to the seminary. They didn't believe it. I said, what are you going to do with all these girls? I said, well, if you want them, you can take them. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't the only one that left that year. We were three that left that year. Uh, myself, Father Bilo, now Reverend Father, and Fadjou Mobi, who ended up in the army. He's a major, he was, I don't know, I think he should still be alive. Major, Major Fadjou Mobi. He ended up in the army. So God snatched two out of three. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so Bilo and myself are still in the priesthood. Um, they didn't believe, really. They didn't actually believe that we were going in for the priesthood. And some people were under the impression that, well, you can go. We know they'll soon throw you out, and then you come back and meet us here. But uh, we, we, we were off it. And there's no, there's no, no rules without a town. So we had our difficulties in the, morning, in the seminary. Like for example, the very first day there, in the minor seminary, I think the meal that was served, I will never forget that, was uh, beans. And I thought, well, I'm used to mashing my food before I swallow it. So the very first spoon I put in my mouth, my goodness, there were pebbles. So I had to pack it. And I asked from one of the seniors, Victor, that was the name there. So how do you eat this thing? There's too much soap. He said, ah, no, he said, let me teach you. Just put it in your mouth, take your water, and push it down. That's all. So, <laughs> so I said, but that's it. How will it be digested? He said, don't worry about that. It will. So we got to manage the others, as other students were managing. And we tried to do what they are doing. Because well, you can easily see, you can easily differentiate Lagos boys, those who are sort of from Lagos, from those who are from other parts. Because the action and things differ. So that one is. I was a piece of a rascal. So I wouldn't say there was anything I fear. Um, I know my father didn't want to hear it that I was going to the seminary because I was the firstborn and uh, he has destined in his own mind that this man should be either uh, an engineer or a doctor or doctor or an engineer. But my mother and the other side were, were just go to me, just put your mind there if it is God that wants you to be there, be there, say your prayers. 
Well, I listened to her more than my daddy, and I think that was what really made the, the big change. Because God listens to all prayers. There's no that he doesn't. Don't forget, he's a Gregorian. You know, according to the logbook of her college, he was enrolled here January 24th, 1951. And as a Gregorian, of course, he, puts up, he remembers the history of the college, the culture, the tradition of the college. One of such is the area of uh, respect a Gregorian gives to his seniors, no matter his status in life. Even though he's a cardinal, he still respects his seniors as well, too. Consequently, he was transferred to St. Theresa's Minor Seminary, Okeare Ibadan, from where, after completing his studies. Now, concerning his character, then he was sincere and straight. Those were the two words used by the, the, the rector there, sincere and straight. And that was the recommendation they gave to him to move into the major seminary. Concerning his sense of responsibility, he was good, very good. He was responsible, though rascally. His disposition was pleasant and willing. Disposition was pleasant and willing. Based on these recommendations, they asked him to move ahead to the major seminary. He proceeded to S.S. Peter and Paul Major Seminary, Bodija Ibadan. Occasionally, you have your own difficulties in the seminary too. Like, uh, I remember in those days, every Thursday, the director comes in and he assembles everybody in the hall. And after giving us a few lecture, the next thing we call somebody else's name, this to his pack and go, go home with your people. So that may be. Because nobody was sure to, be, to see the next, next month leaving the seminary. So anytime we are going in for that kind of meeting, in the minor, this was in the minor seminary, anytime we are going to have that kind of meeting, everybody gives us because they don't know whose turn it is. So, but thank God we scaled through. With all my rascality, I was not even touched. The only day was when I sneaked out. When I sneaked out of the seminary. Um, it was on the Sunday. After Vespers, that's the major seminary now. After Vespers, very funny thing happened. But I had a friend, um, he's dead now, God rest his soul. He too became a priest. Uh, Father, what's his name? But he changed his name, he used to be Francis Etuboku, but he changed his name to Afemifuna, Francis Etuboku, he's dead. And so that day, we decided to leave, to, to sneak out of the compound as we normally do, generally do. So uh, we went as far, imagine from Bodija, we have to trek up to Ogumba, that's the major there where you have the cathedral. And there's a photographer, the area of photos. So we just went there and landed there. And we're there reading papers, because you can't read the paper in the seminary by then. So we're reading papers and writing letters and doing. So by the time we look at it, at the time it was something, some minutes to six. Ah, it's a Francis, look at the time. Ah, I said, don't worry, we got there. So by the time we got home, they had finished their dinner. They were now strolling, which was the last exercise before going in for night prayers and then for studies. So we had to cross the barrier that we had. So I said, Francis, let me go in first. If the road is clear, I let you know. If it is not clear. So I went in. I didn't even know Francis was following me. And who were those coming? Right? We met, we had saw coming from here. The opposite of now Bishop, Bishop Padlonge, Bishop Makosi, Bishop Epu, Archbishop Epu, Oyewale, he didn't go through, and one or two others. So I said, no, then Francis said, let's run. He said, no, they don't run. Let's be going. So we just faced them. I said, let's face them. He said, no, no, no. So by when we had about the, uh, two meters to the place, to them, to meet them, and something just came into me and I said, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, none are there for death, amen. So we passed them, and they thought we were praying. <laughs> so I will never forget that day. I said, ha. Ah. Then when we called God to the bench, friends said, ah, I told you you're a crook. I said, you have to use your head. So that's the, the part of the life here, Jesus. We are now. She, she saved us. <laughs> we were, we beseeched. We called her heart to her point, and she did. So, and both of us went through. That's it. I will never forget that. It's a very, 
because they, they, didn't, they didn't even know that uh, we who are just coming from outside. <laughs> they, they say the devil must always have his day. Oh <laughs> they, I think each and every one of us will have two, two, two sides. The way I'm looking at you is not the way others will look at you. The way, uh, you are the only one that can tell people what you really are. Okay. Sincerity. If Cardinal is not happy about something, you see it right on his face. Neat. It's like a signboard. And then, I used to admire, permit me to use that word, his anger. The Cardinal's anger, I used to admire. To the recipient of that anger, it is not interesting. But where the beauty comes in his anger is that he's angry, he expresses it, and that is it. He grows up and it comes down. And when it comes down, forget it. It's all finished. So you'll be wasting your time and killing yourself if after what he has told you, you go back and you, you, you lose your sleep. You don't need to lose your sleep. He's not thinking about you anymore. He's finished with you. What he wants to express, he has expressed. It's up to you to go and work on it. In 1961, having completed his seminary courses, Tony, better known as Brother Okoje, was posted to Our Lady of Assumption Catholic Church, Ijebuigbo, where he carried out his first pastoral assignment as a seminarian under Reverend Father McLaughlin, popularly known as Baba Olomowewe, the father of little children. At the end of his stint at Ijebuigbo, Brother Okoje returned to S.S. Peter and Paul Seminary, from where, due to his overall performance, he was selected alongside another seminarian, Brother Felix Alabajo, and now Archbishop of Ibadan, to proceed to the Catholic University in Rome to complete his seminary courses. He had an initial language challenge in Rome, where he needed two important languages, Italian, which was the language of tuition and everyday life in Rome, and Latin, which is the official language of the Universal Catholic Church. But this did not stay a challenge for long. After completing his course in Rome, Antonia returned to Lagos in June 1966, and less than six months later, on December 4th, 1966, was ordained a priest at the Holy Cross Cathedral, Lagos, the same church where he had years ago been a regular altar server. And so, Anthony Olubumi Okoje had come full circle. Father Anthony Okoje hadn't yet come to stay at Holy Cross Cathedral because almost immediately after his ordination, he returned to Rome for his master's degree program. This he completed in one year after which he returned home to begin his pastoral duties. His first posting was again Holy Cross as associate parish and priest in charge of St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Dumago, Lagos. Again, if Reverend Father Anthony Olubumi Okoje thought he had come to settle at the comparatively seeded job of a parish priest, the divine will add other plans for him. The Nigeria Civil War broke out in January 1967, and later that same year, Father Anthony was seconded to the Nigeria Hermit Chaplaincy, which posted him to the war front with the third marine commandos under the command of Brigadier General Benjamin Adekule, the renowned Black Scorpion. As army chaplain, Father Okoje's duty was to look after the spiritual needs of the troops, administering the sacrament, praying for them, celebrating Holy Mass, and praying for the repose of the souls of the dead. At the end of the Civil War in 1970, Reverend Father Okoje returned to Holy Cross Cathedral, Lagos. This time, he was saddled with more responsibilities, 
He was the master of the ceremonies, MC, at the major archdiocesan equaristic celebrations. The day I was ordained a priest, March, no, August 15, 1971, he was the MC at the, at the, at the event, master of ceremonies, at the ordination mass. That was his job, he was the ad, MC of the Lagos Archdiocese, assisting the Archbishop. Uh, Aguirre at that time, so he was there in you know, his official capacity. Assisting His Grace John Kwao Aguirre, the Archbishop of Lagos, an area which at that time comprised the current Lagos Archdiocese, as well as the Ijebode and Abekuta Diocese. These responsibilities made Father Anthony very visible and increased his popularity among his colleagues. A year after his return from the war front, Reverend Father Anthony Okoje was consecrated auxiliary bishop of Oyo Diocese on August 29, 1971, months less than five years after his ordination as a priest. Uh, going out in the car one morning, he said to me, did you listen to the radio? I said, no. He said, the radio said I'm a bishop. I said, why did they say that? He said, I don't know. I didn't know him much as a priest. Also because Okoje didn't live too much as, for long as a reverend father. However, even though Anthony Okoje has roots in Oyo through his mother, his appointment was characterized by local tribal problems, ignorance and rejection. When Cardinal was here as a bishop, no Cardinal, Maybe it's good to mention it. I think the Baptist really welcomed him because they were the one that gave him the house where he was living as a bishop. Then, you know, I guess the whites were just around there, and then they, they needed another house for the bishop, and it was the Baptist that gave the house where he was living. I think it's not worthy to know about that. God works in mysterious ways. It's wonders to perform and perform it did again and again in Okoje's life. In the year following his installation as Auxiliary Bishop of Oyo, Okoje was transferred back to Lagos and installed Auxiliary Archbishop to the Apostolic Administrator of Lagos Archdiocese. The following year, on May 3, 1973, he was appointed the substantive Archbishop of Lagos, and on June 17, 1973, exactly one day after his 37th birthday, Anthony Okoje was enthroned as the third Archbishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Lagos. Following the date of the erstwhile Archbishop, His Grace John Kwao Age. With this appointment, the rejected stone had become the cornerstone Proving the popular saying that when God says yes, no one can say no. <music> Young Anthony Okoje's growth and rise in God's vineyard was indeed a surprise to himself as it was to those around him. But it was all the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Because of his age, Anthony Okoje, being the youngest archbishop in the country, some people were skeptical about the ability of the new archbishop to cope with the responsibility that had been placed on his young and comparatively inexperienced shoulders. People thought he was too young, that he might not be able to cope with the demands of that office. But over the years, I believe God had directed him very, very well. And today, whatever he says, each time he opens his mouth to talk, people wait, they listen, they bring out so much out of what he has to say. I say, this young priest, at the age of 37, I think, he was made the archbishop. I said, how will you be able to carry out this heavy responsibility? But his grace, Anthony Okoje, was undeterred. 
placing his trust in Almighty God, who has chosen him, his hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose footsteps as priest he was treading. The wisdom supplied by the Holy Spirit and in the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of the clergy, is said to walk with a wheel. He knew well enough what his primary assignment was. It was to increase the kingdom of God on earth by winning souls for him. It was the Cardinal himself who attended and performed the ceremony of my becoming a Catholic and took me through five sacraments and I took the first communion. He gave me the first communion. On the 1st of January 1990, I was appointed a military governor for Katsina State. And what I did first, after taking the oath, was to run to the Cardinal's residence. Next, I asked him to bless me because I had an assignment I thought I would not be able to accomplish. And he did. He One of my most memorable uh, encounters with him was when I went to see him to ask for his blessing when I was uh, offering myself for service as the governor of Lagos State. By his reckoning, one sure way of achieving this was to make it easy for people to reach a place of worship, which meant that churches had to build closer to them. By the time of Archbishop Okoje's consecration, there were 17 parishes, so he set out with a diligence and single-mindedness that is characteristic of him to increase the number of parishes in the archdiocese. This has been an ongoing project which has yielded so much fruit, such that at present there are over a hundred parishes in the archdiocese, not counting the numerous outstations and mass centers by any standard this has been an outstanding achievement of Okoje's administration and has, in fact, led to the Archdiocese of Lagos being recognized as the fastest growing diocese in the Universal Church. Cardinal Okoje has achieved a lot in the Archdiocese of Lagos. I can positively say that the Archdiocese needs at least two to three bishops to maintain his achievement after his retirement. His record being the youngest archbishop, increasing 17 parishes to more than 100, and the longest serving archbishop is a record that will be very difficult to beat in this century. In addition to the modern church buildings in these parishes, he has given approval and support to the many physical development taking place in all of them. The Catholic Archdiocese of Lagos has earned an enviable reputation as a provider of quality primary health care and under Archbishop Okoje's administration, Many parishes have medical clinics open to citizens irrespective of their religious belief. In fact, some of these clinics are upgrading to mini hospitals to add to the services provided by many existing Catholic hospitals in the Archdiocese. As a crowning glory on the provision of medical services, he has officially opened the ultra more than St. Raphael Divine Mercy Specialist Hospital in Ijede, Ekorodu, Lagos. Quality education is another hallmark of the Catholic Church in Lagos, and he has not neglected that aspect of human development. At a point when the government unilaterally took over mission schools in Lagos, 
He was, along with others, a relentless advocate of the return of the schools. He has imparted a lot in terms of determination. He never says no. As soon as there is the will, there must be a way. So he struggles and struggles and struggles. And uh, I can remember, as a young priest, following him either to the courts or struggling for the school. The determination, the endurance, even when it appears humiliation from the then government of Jatonde, he kept on. And everybody came to discourage him, to tell him you can never win government. He kept on telling me, when we are going, I will see to the end. I will see to the end. I believe in justice. I believe in fairness. So it's a man who knows what he wants. He goes after it. He's so persevering. He does not give up. And at the end of the good, the good Lord answers him. He's a courageous spiritual man. And then coming in contact with him, you know that um, we are coming in contact with a great man. He is bold. He is fearless. At a time during the civil war, he was always talking, opposing the military government. I know his grandmother, uh, the mother of his mother, as a very old woman, went to him. You can check, cross check what I'm now saying. The grandmother went to him. Say, my son, your mouth is too wide. I, I want you to bury me, not me to bury you. Talk less. The schools were eventually returned and the church has been able to resume a provision of quality secondary education. And now, the cardinal has gone one step further by the establishment of a university in Lagos Catholic Archdiocese. Augustine University is located at Elara Ekpe Lagos State and is expected to deliver the same quality education for which the Catholic Church is renowned. While taking care of physical and mental development of the faithful within the Archdiocese, Archbishop Okoje has not neglected the need for the clergy and religious with the support for the establishment and growth of different others and congregations. In fact, not overlooking the needs of those called to the contemplative life, the Archbishop has also established the Mata Ecclesia Monastery, headed by Mother Benedicta of Jesus at Shongutedo, Aja, Lagos. Archbishop Okoji expresses his realization of the tremendous support he has received morally, spiritually, and in physical and monetary terms through a highly developed virtue of gratitude. He says thank you 200 times and you get embarrassed because you wonder why he's thanking you for something that has been a privilege for you, you know, to be able to do that is a big privilege and then he he tells you thank you, and he's saying it with so much, um, with so much seriousness. Given the commitment of the Universal Catholic Church to the fulfillment of our Lord Jesus Christ's desire that all faithful be one, Archbishop Okoje has been a devout apostle of the ecumenical movement, which has seen all Christian denominations and sects coming together to form the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN. In fact, His Grace was the first national president of CAN, to which he gave highly credible leadership. And up till now, even though he no longer holds office in it, he is a staunch supporter of the association, being considered primus inter pares, first among equals. He has been installed patron of the Lagos Island chapter of Khan. It's not a matter of he is, he is a Roman Catholic. No. You see, his eminence is a leader in the Christian fold today. Not even in the Catholic uh, denomination. I have come to know his eminence. I have come to hear about his name, Okoji, Okoji, when I was not even a Christian. When I was not born again. 
when I was younger, I've been hearing this man, Okoje, Okoje. And then I knew he represented the body of Christ. Long before Khan, however, his voice had been heard way beyond the confines of the Catholic Church in Nigeria. He is an unapologetic critic of less than quality leadership in governance. Very constructive in his comment, he is not one to compromise the truth at any time, irrespective of which government was in power. Whenever a government embarked on a course of action that was detrimental to the well-being or intruded on the human rights of the citizen, he will be up in hymns, denouncing such a move or policy, and his argument were always well thought out and honest in all attempts to buy off, intimidate, or coerce him proved fertile. He will speak his mind once he was convinced that his thoughts were in line with Christian virtues and were for the common good. In fact, he has come to be known as the voice of the voiceless and champion of the poor. Each time Cardinal believes that the people are crying or they are seeking for something, he uses his position, elevated position, to speak out on behalf of the people. That is very important. For me, what it represents is the face of courage, the face of truth, inspiration, and people like Cardinal remind you to stand by what you believe, even if you are standing alone. He has never been afraid to be wrong or to be perceived to be wrong. And that is a good virtue across the board because sometimes it is difficult to do the right thing when you do not seem to have support. So in that sense, he's inspirational and he's a mentor. He likes to bring succor to the disadvantaged and to the dis uh, disgruntled. He likes to give faith and hope to those who are down there who think that they cannot find a, I mean, a solution to their problem, he gives them hope. And that has been his contention. If the Catholic Bishops Conference has, is on record as being one of the frontline agents of, uh, uh, of um, fighting for the return of democracy to Nigeria, uh, if that is true, then Akhtar Koji is one of the main frontline agents. Uh, voices in that uh, in that regard. I was detained, and taken into custody for three months, eighteen days. He will fly from Lagos to Abuja to hear confession from me mm. in detention, and he will open his uh, post like this and give me holy communion. So adamant in condemning uh, anything that is corrupt and oh, oh, oh. anything that is not genuine, anything that is not orthodox, anything that is not uh, 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 according to the mind of the church. I think he, he has that from his uh, family background. He's kind of fearless, you know. Uh, is not cowed by any situation or incidents. Even though uh, Orom is his roots, but you know that uh, he, he was born and bred in Lagos. This is the question. Yeah. But uh, by, by character, by social upbringing and everything, is a Lagosian. As a social critic, Okoje is scrupulously fair giving praise when a government action is pro-people and roundly condemning when it is selfish and not for the public good. The only see at the Vatican must have been taking notice of the huge success Archbishop Okoje was making of his administration and so decided to elevate him. 
on September 28, 2003, Pope John Paul II created Anthony Olubumi Okoje, Cardinal of the Universal Catholic Church. On October 21, 2003, His Eminence Anthony Cardinal Okoje was in Rome for his investiture to the great joy of Nigerians. Catholics and non-Catholics alike, here was a Nigerian being raised to the ranks of the less than 1,000 princes of the church of over a billion faithful worldwide. It had pleased God who called him to his service to raise Anthony Olubume Okoje from being a prince of earthly kingdom to become a prince of his eternal kingdom on earth, the church. And so, as Psalm 113 predicts, the Lord has given him, Anthony Okoje, a seat with the leaders of the people. He has done us proud in the country and outside the country. Thanks to him, in many instances, we can put our head high as Catholics because of his contribution, even in the country and outside the country. If anyone thought that Okoje's elevation would now make him live the easy life. Nothing could be further from the truth. The cardinal is, if anything, even more hardworking than before, hardly ever going to bed before 1.30 a.m. and rising at the crack of dawn to prepare for morning mass at the Holy Cross Cathedral, the same church where he had been an altar server as a boy. So, many years earlier, was later ordained a priest and consecrated Archbishop. Crossing the road to the cathedral opposite his residence, the cardinal, as he had done for decades, lays his congregation of dedicated worshippers at morning mass, which he celebrates, exalting, praying for, administering holy communion, and blessing the flocks entrusted to him to shepherd. Cardinal Okoje's life is a study in humility and simplicity for an individual who has access to so much resources and highly placed people and who himself is recognized worldwide. Cardinal Okoje lives a very simple life, not given to ostentation, living in the same house he had for years. In his humility, his eminence has time for everyone. No matter how busy he is, he will create time to meet those who have to see him with their special needs. If you know him, his yes is his yes, his no is his no. He doesn't condone um, laziness. And uh, if he gives you an assignment and you do it, he has absolute trust in you. He commends you. And his network is always available, if I can say so. <laughs> and very hardworking man. And a good shepherd. It is humility is amazing. I don't know anyone who can control so much resources, people, and he's still so humble about it. Something I couldn't forget. You can't believe that the bishop left his room, his bed, for me to sleep. He slept somewhere else. You could see how humble this man is. He left his room. I slept on his bed for one week. And during the homily, he told us how some members of our church came to him and pleaded with him not to post the Reverend Father that was there at that time who built the church, built the hall, built the clinic, and I think the Father's house. They said the father, the Reverend Father had done so much, he should not post him. And the response of Cardinal Okoje was, we were given glory to human beings. Mm -hmm. That the glory belonged to God. That it was God that brought that Reverend Father there. It was God that helped him to achieve what he achieved. 
So we must glorify God and allow him to go on to repeat what he had done there somewhere else. He believes that everybody deserves attention. If, if a chicken writes a letter to Cardinal Kogi, he will get a reply. If a goat writes to him, he will get a reply. He will always reply to anybody. He is a very exacting person. He demands the very best from you, from anybody. So he will, he will put you, keep you on your toes at all times. So we need to say, the nearer you get to Okoje, the hotter it becomes mm -hmm. for you. It will be uh, too hard at times. Okay. Huh? Mm -hmm. Too hard at times. Okay. When it sticks to a point, it sticks to it. And that goes with this is A tough person. A tough person. Who, despite his toughness, also acknowledges his own human nature. Even when he will talk to us priests in a harsh way, which he does from time to time, he will remind us that when I'm talking to you like that, I'm talking to myself too. One thing that really touched me was his ability to instill discipline in the archdiocese. As an administrator as well, the interest of the church has to come first. So when you have to discipline people, you discipline people. When you have to put on the cap of a complete father, where you pamper people, you also try to do that. So I would say that at least from the point of view of maybe discipline, he was able to impact positively on his diocese. Because it got to a point that you know that people will tell you, ah, if you're from Lagos, then you must be disciplined. Which I think it's something was able to achieve in Lagos. And perhaps that's why Lagos is still the way it is. So no matter what, you have to give him that credit that he was able to instill discipline in the diocese, in both the priests and religious. And of course, I want to say also, in the laity, in the adults of Lagos, so that wherever we go out and you say you're from Lagos, people are caught a certain level of respect to you on the basis of that because they tend to believe that you're disciplined and they take it for granted that you should be disciplined, that you cannot behave just as you like. His humility, you know, he came down to our level, uh, interacted with us, he was curious. You know, he asked questions and we responded. We were free with him. It was so simple. For me, that is very important. That made a great impression on me. And I would say it's a privilege to be associated with his eminence, the Cardinal. Especially for my kids, you know. Maybe we pose with him too, without him knowing himself. For my kids, for instance, you know, I tried to let them know that you don't need to make noise for God to hear you. you know? And I guess that's what this gen uh, the cardinal was trying to pass on. You know? God, of course, you can praise him, you can do all that, but for that particular mass that he came with, you know, he celebrated with us, you know, it has been like a landmark for me. That one has to, you know, do things the right way sometimes. His generosity is well known. That virtue which he had exhibited as a people has developed in him to an extent that is almost legendary. Whatever gift he receives that is not personalized, and there are many the cardinal gives away to someone who will have more need for it, an individual, layman or clergy, a family, a parish or, or, or convent or school. He also gives generously to charity, to the different homes for the underprivileged within and outside the metropolises of Lagos. And on a more personal level, every Monday morning, he gives donations to the large number of the needy who flock to his office. Cardinal is good. Since I've been working with him, it's nice to me. It's through him I achieve many of my 
many of my things in life. So I can't forget him even till he retired. At least I build house and he knows about it. Why I like to work with him is that through him I learn many things. At least I can save. I know how to manage. Many, many things like that. I appreciate the strong sense of commitment he has to his duties, particularly the way he does his work. When you see him celebrating the Mass, the seriousness he puts into celebrating the Mass. When you see him working in the office, you know, he has time, he's dedicated to the people. Some people see him even on the road, they begin to talk to him. Even those that you think the society will reject, he has time for them, he chats with them on the road. So you see that dedication in him flowing between the high and the mighty of the society. I appreciate that so much about him. Cardinal Okoje has a genuine love for children, and they are aware of it, and draw to him everywhere he goes. And, as Jesus said and did in the Bible, the Cardinal invites little children to come to him. As a matter of fact, in furtherance of his love and concern for children and the youths, different annual events have been instituted in the Ash Diocese, where the Cardinal at separate occasions meet with children, youths, and single. The Vatican must have been impressed by Archbishop Okoje's scrupulous and prudent financial management ability, which resulted in his being appointed when created Cardinal, a member of the Finance Commission in charge of the Vatican Finance. Not forgetting the family he came from, Cardinal Okoje has never neglected his relations, unfailingly visiting the family home every week. His visits are eagerly awaited and welcomed by his relations. He was actually one of the best children of the grandparents. Larry, Larry. for Larry and Okoje's family, they have been blessed by having an important figure. Time. Growing up has been very pleasant. Growing up with him, he was very serious-minded, respectable, dutiful, cheerful. In fact, a force to be reckoned. He's actually a leader. I can remember he, he made me to love the children. We cherish his, uh, his, his views about life, of being simplicity, which is unique with this family. He wants every everything to be everybody to be simple. He doesn't want uh, um, arrogancy and everything. To be simple, humble and everything. I won't say much. Uh, I have just two things to say. Uh, one by going to the minor seminary, he influenced me. Uh, then then when I was small, I see him as uh, each, each time he comes in, while he was still in the seminary, major seminary, I see him as a special person. I want to tell you that uh, knowing Cardinal, uh, I cherish his uh, views about life and his opinions on politics. Uh, I have always known him to be a very disciplinary person. What she doesn't like in me is that if you see me playing with uh, those young young boys and can you continue shouting on me, said, Daddy, Daddy, I'll go and tell Papa that you are going to uh, Lafayette like Club or something like that. I will shout on him. I said, Don't leave me. Oh, leave me. Because Papa asked you to be pushing me. Visiting his relations is not Cardinal Okoje's only mode of relaxation. The revered prelate has fear for sports such as lawn tennis, wrestling and boxing, having been a footballer in his youth. The Cardinal still enjoys watching football, particularly matches of his favorite, Asna Football Club. By virtue of his being a Cardinal, Anthony Olubome Okoje had the privilege of being in the conclave of cardinals that elected the current aid of the Catholic Church, Pope Benedict XVI, in 2005, as successor to the late Pope, now Blessed John Paul II. He has grown 
physically. He has grown socially. He has grown spiritually. A lot of change has happened. A man of 75, you do not compare him with a man of just uh, in his teens. And so, since we met in that hallowed grounds of Okiare, St. Teresa's Minor Seminary, I've known him to have developed in a very, very mature way. In the sense that he has grown intellectually, putting himself to the task, making himself a man. You see, you do not become a man just because of age. You become a man because you surmount difficulties, you toughen yourself, and you become what God wants you to be. And so he has developed. He has developed in his studies. He has gone from his childish ways into the youthful ways, and from the youthful ways into the adult life. And I can tell you that he has changed a lot. Yes. I might to tell you one story. The first opportunity we had to, go, to work manual labor in Okiare. My Tony said, both of us were sent to harvest Grand Knot. My Tony said, there's no, no trees here. <laughs> <laughs> so he has grown a lot. He thought that Grand Knots grew on trees. I pray that his desires, his desire for the Catholic Church will be achieved within his tenure and that he will feel fulfilled by the time he retires. And I pray that God will grant him long life, give him peace, give him good health. And so, the little boy, Anthony Olubume Ehohime Okoje, metamorphosed through many stages as altar server, seminarian, reverend father, Bishop and the longest serving Archbishop with the largest Archdiocese in the whole world to become simply Anthony Cardinal Okoje, a Prince of the Universal Catholic Church, voice of the voiceless, friend of the needy, eminent Nigerian devoted son of the Blessed Virgin Mary, an effective instrument under the direction of the Holy Spirit, a winner of souls for Christ, and a servant of God. To God be the glory.